and where, where we can take some of the ideas that Mark and Kirk are going to share with you tonight. Um, just a little bit about Resound, for those who don't know, we're a strategy and technology consulting firm. We have about 23,000 employees, mostly in the D.C. area, working a lot of federal companies, but also commercial clients. We have a data science practice that's over 500, 550 uh, team members. Uh, I'm a member of that, as are Kirk and Mark. And uh, if you are interested in that, we uh, this, I'm going to go ahead and make my announcement now and save you from coming back to me later. Uh, we are always hiring. We are always looking for individuals who are doing full stack developments, especially uh, Hadoop and Accumulo. And we have a couple of folks in the back there, Sue and Tatum, who would be happy to chat with you if you have any interest or any questions. And of course, you can find me, Mark, or Kirk, if you would like to follow up. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, Citizens.com is a long time supporter of EC2 and of DSDC in particular. I know Janet's back there from Citizens.com. Uh, actually, I think the next there you go. Or so. Hey, hey, I'm Janet Dobbins from Citizens.com. We do online courses in statistics and data science. And as many of our instructors, we um, gather from this great group of um, data scientists here. So um, if you are interested in a uh, Mark was teaching a course for us uh, Hadoop and Analytics just recently. So if you're um, interested in taking a deeper dive into a course, please come to statistics.com and um, feel free to use a promo code um, DCPS2016. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. So obviously sponsors help us both in kind by hosting us as well as monetarily tonight. Booth have been very kind to donate the, the food as well, but yeah. usually we have food and location and various things that need, you know, some greenbacks. Uh, and, you know, one of the things we've always liked, especially with DSCC, is that we'd rather have empanadas than pizza, and so we eat money for that. <laughs> um, um, but if you or your company would like to sponsor D uh, DC2 or a meetup or there's interest, in the symbiotic relationship, uh, please talk to any of the organizers. Um, we're always on the lookout for sponsors. Uh, like I said, Citizens.com has been a long-term sponsor, as has Booz, um, as has Microsoft for SBDC. So um, please find us um, and make the community stronger by your support. Um, I was mentioning to someone earlier today that these meetups are your meetups. It's not about us up front here. We're just the facilitators getting places and together. It's really about you guys, and there's a lot of knowledge out here that people <coughs> can share, will share. So please find us. Um, this is just a short list, a very incomplete short list of stuff I'm, we're interested in in terms of software and SDGC, but you know, whatever you're doing, it's actually something that's shareable. Please come and talk to us. And one of the things that we've um, changed over the last few months, we actually have a site where you can sign up to be a speaker. <coughs> We will, the owners will get information from that um, form, and so you can. So we'll come back and contact you. So this is a volunteer effort. We're trying to make this as easy as possible to get good speakers um, to speak at our events. Um, I especially to encourage um, women and minority speakers to come. We've just been very painfully informed that we have, have been very white male over the last uh, <laughs> few years in terms of the speakers. Um, and so I, I know there's a, very, a lot of smart people doing a lot of smart things. So um, I encourage everyone to please come and speak at our events and uh, get your face out here, get, your, get what you're doing out there. Um, Datable is an effort that um, DC2 has started, what, Sean, about eight months, a year ago? Depends on how you want to think about it. It's okay. Like <laughs> April, May. So how do you think about it? You're, you're doing it. <laughs> I started off, oh, do you want me to talk? Sure. <laughs> I was trying to get on the Wi-Fi, it's like a porn dev pillow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we started off the year trying to figure out what it is that everybody <coughs> wants in this network. The one consistent thing is people looking for opportunities. People are either looking for a good place to work or people are looking for good people to work with them. And um, so we're like, all right, now how do we bring all of this together and turn it into a systematic process so that way, um, you know, it just runs the natural course of all the events. And uh, as some of the other people on our board can attest to, that's been a difficult path. 
um, <laughs> when we've come to this. And uh, so there's all the other events that we hold. There's, uh, uh, as he pointed out, the uh, the other events in data is and, um, this is data science, physical programming, night owls. There's the data education, this full stack data science. There's Nova data science, and there's like two or three others. Um, and there's people like this going to those <coughs> events too, and there's opportunities coming through those events too. We're bringing that all together. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, just come talk to me. And of course, we're at Booz Allen. They've been kind enough to give us this space. Um, and I can help make introductions there as well. Who are the other Booz people here? So everybody knows who to go to, and they don't just overwhelm one person. We've got Booz, 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 Booz. <laughs> this isn't the bar, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, speaking of booze, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we have a space for a bit. We get charged up to about uh, a block and a half from here. So they can cross the Christian Square and the block on down the street. Where else are you going to hang out at a bar talking to like my idea? So um, we usually take a few minutes, or I'm going to take very short few minutes. Uh, so if anyone has announcements from the community, jobs, meetups that you want to announce, hackathons, conferences that are going on, um, please, now is the time to uh, stand up and be heard.
introduction. Welcome all of you uh, to the Blue Dollar Innovation Center, where all kinds of cool stuff happens. In fact, it's so cool that in order to work in this building as Blue Dollar employee, you have to apply and wait to get on a waiting list. <laughs> and so there's like an IoT lab, a drone lab, a 3D printing lab, and just all kinds of great things happen here. And uh, this is where most of our summer interns hang out during the summer and create unbelievable things for us. And so anyway, so we're very happy you could be here with us tonight. And I'm really happy to, to be speaking at this event. Uh, so tonight's uh, little presentation, uh, Mark and I are both going to do something about, about a quarter, 20, 25 minutes each. So I'm going to start getting high signs from people. That's probably because I'm uh, taking too much of the floor. As a professor, I, it's always dangerous to hand me a microphone, but I'll try to keep it under three hours. My, my, my usual lectures are three hours on Tuesday nights. I always tell my suits, when we, when we get out of class at 10 p.m., all the other classrooms in the building will be empty because all the other professors have already closed out their classes for the night. But I said, I'm going to give you your full money to go to the full three hours. Occasionally, I'm going to two minutes over. And, you know, unfortunately for me, and unfortunately for my students, I'm going to tell them they're actually not. Anyway, so, so tonight's lecture is not really about TensorFlow. It's more about machine learning. But in the context of TensorFlow, uh, yeah, the, yes. Before you get into your flow, could you hold that mic a little closer? OK. Folks in the background can turn the I can scream. I can talk very loud if I need to, but I don't think you want that too loud. But okay, <laughs> people back there, uh, there's a board game going on back there, so I'm competing with something, I think. Okay, so uh, so Angela's taking my picture. Hi, Angela. Anyway, so uh, so Angela Zutaner back there is uh, one of the VPs for Booz Allen. Uh, she, she's the one who corrected me when I first started working for the firm, and I said, I'm a principal data scientist. And she said, no, Kirk, you are the principal data scientist. <laughs> and so what that means is that's what the company calls me. I call myself the honeybee of data science, where data science flowers are blooming. That's where I go and pollinate those flowers. Uh, all kinds of different client spaces, and different, things, different accounts, and different places where we have that conversation about analytics, and data science, and machine learning, what it can do for you, what it can do for your organization, uh, what, can, what kind of data do you have, and how can you use that for, uh, to drive benefit and value for your organization. So that's what I do. Uh, I, I give the talk, and then there's like a thousand plus data scientists in the firm who deliver. So I, I make the promises, and other people deliver. People like Mark. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so I, so I call myself the honeybee of data scientists, uh, and like I said, the firm calls me the principal data scientist, or sometimes the brand ambassador for data science. But my my fellow colleagues, they just call me the data science mascot. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, who's without the E? Uh, so so this talk originated in a, in a TensorFlow meetup in DC, and I know that Anne was at that talk. And, uh, anyone else was at that talk? If you, you were there a few months ago, you probably saw this. So my apologies. Uh, but the way that the way that conversation went, went is uh, in, in spring I got a call from the TensorFlow meetup group here in DC and they said, Can you give us a talk on TensorFlow at our meetup in June? And I said, Hmm, I don't know anything about TensorFlow, so yes, I'll do that. <laughs> uh, so one thing I learned uh, in, in many years of teaching is that the, the absolute worst way ever to learn a course is to take the course. Uh, the next best way to learn the subject is to be a TA in the course, but the absolute best way to ever learn a subject is to teach. <laughs> so I, I took advantage of that. And so that's what I'm here to say to talk about tonight. So I'm going to tell you some stories about uh, uh, machine learning uh, and, uh, in the short amount of time I have, hopefully uh, you know, be um, beneficial in relation to this concept of TensorFlow, uh, which is a, a technique used in deep learning. Deep learning is sort of one of the latest phases in the machine learning world. And uh, it's, it's been used a lot in sort of a video and, and image recognition and, and, and pattern and uh, feature discovery in images and, and, and video. But it's also being used now here in, uh, for example, in text analytics or discovering patterns of text. Of course, it was also used uh, in, in the AlphaGo game where uh, the, uh, the champion Go player of the world uh, was beat four games to one by the AlphaGo computer, which was a deep learning machine uh, that basically identified patterns on the board. Speaking of board games, you know, we'll back to this uh, uh, So looking at patterns and understanding those patterns and what did they tell us. So TensorFlow is about finding a good model to describe something and a, a lot of times when we work with models, we were faced with this situation as shown on this graph, that we're, we're faced with uh, either overfitting or underfitting our models. And what we want to find is that sweet spot. I call that the Goldilocks model, the one that's just right. OK, so overfitting, so these are just some very simple representations of a more complex concept. And so the curve on the right of this plot is a, a thing that's labeled D of X. <coughs> you labeled it mine. I just found this plot somewhere. Uh, so D of X, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 a sequence of line segments that fit through every single point in that diagram. And so you, you can say that I, that my, my model fits every <coughs> single point with zero error. 
but zero error is not a very good representation of that data because it, it, it's not capturing the, the actual true variance of the data. It's, it's actually trying to model and follow the variance of the data. So anytime you have a model that has zero error, you're probably in trouble, okay? Because there's because there is natural variance, okay? So that's overfitting, okay? So you're you're, you're missing the natural variance in the data. But the, at the other extreme is what uh, is called in statistics uh, by bias. So bias is underfitting. So bias is an interesting word. It basically means you're, you're not using all the information you have to make a decision. So that's how we normally describe bias in the real world. In statistics, it's a real statistical term. Bias is underfitting. So the curve on the left side, side g of x, that's fitting a line through, uh, in this case, a line through those data points. Okay, so it's, it's trying to fit that collection of data points with two parameters, a slope and an intercept. So those two parameters are insufficient to fully describe the data. So that's underfitting. That's a biased model. So the best model, that sweet spot, the Goldilocks model, is that g of x there. All right, so, so overfitting is bad data science versus underfitting is bad data science. So, so, so this is going to be important in a few minutes here because what we're, what we're searching for is that sweet spot in our modeling where we're, we're not uh, biased or, and we're not uh, uh, fitting the variance. The natural, we're not trying to follow the natural variance in the data, something that, that should be there. There should, there should be uh, some kind of error in your, in your curve. So how many people in the room have ever done like a, a least squares fitting, least squares regression? Okay, so what is least squares? It's minimizing the squared error of your curve with respect to the data points. You're not trying to re achieve zero summed error, you're trying to find the minimum summed error, okay, for a particular fit. And it, could be, it could be linear or it could be a quadratic or whatever. But the idea is that you want to recognize that there is some natural variance there and you want to not try to follow every single wiggle in your data. So I want to tell this in the context of a story uh, that uh, takes me back to several years, before, even before I was at George Mason University. I was at NASA for quite a few years and working in the large data systems. So as an astrophysicist, I was doing data by night, and my day job was doing data by day. <laughs> so I was working with the Hubble te Telescope, uh, the, the data archive for Hubble, and then uh, working at the Space Sciences Data Operations Office for NASA, which was dealing with data from all the space science missions. But I was working with data every day, and as I said, my night job as well, so to speak. And one of the things we got uh, an opportunity to work with is some, some uh, satellite data uh, that the National Weather Service was using. So these are satellites that are, that are launched and, and operated by NASA, but the, but the end user of the data is, uh, is NOAA, uh, the Na uh, National Oceanographic and, Admi Admis and Atmospheric Administration, i.e. the National Weather Service. And so they're trying to identify wildfires in images. Okay, so the wildfires are these things that just grow, that fires that take place uh, in, in forests or in grasslands or in the remote regions, and then they're not normally fires that people see unless you happen to live in close proximity to that, to that place. And the, the, what they were trying to accomplish here was not uh, firefighting. They weren't, they weren't trying to you know, be the, 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 the group that sends out the alarm to the fire trucks, hey, there's a fire, go get they put out the fire. Uh, that's not what they were trying to achieve. They were trying to understand uh, what is the sort of the global thermal input to climate models uh, from fires around the world. Okay, so there's, there's an input of thermal energy to our entire climate system uh, from these fires, and whether they're natural fires or, or unnatural fires, it, 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 it didn't really matter. They just wanted to know how many and where and how big of these fires are around the world. And so they, 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 what they did is they hired a bunch of analysts who looked at satellite images every day, and then they would look at these till their eyes crossed, I swear to God. <laughs> and what they would look at these images, and then they would get hundreds, of, if not thousands of images every day, and it was a 24-7 operation there, so they had a number of people that ran this operation, and they could basically only cover the continental U.S. They couldn't even look at the rest of the world because there was just too much data and too few people and not enough resources. And so, so when, when they see the image, they see a bright spot in an image, then they had to get on the phone and call someone, hey, is your, is your forest on fire? <laughs> and then maybe they can't identify the right person, so they could call around so they find the right person to talk to. So this was a very time-consuming task and very incomplete, obviously, since it only covered the continental U.S. So the idea was that, hey, can you, can you help us develop an algorithm that can identify fires in satellite imagery? And again, because we're talking about climate model inputs, it doesn't matter if we have like a 5% error or something like that, right? Because if you miss 5% five, miss of the fires, you're not adding those to the climate model, but you've also called 5% of the things fires that shouldn't be called fires, so they basically cancel out. Okay, so having a few percent is a big deal. You just needed to have some way of covering the whole earth. So we, so we uh, proposed to do an artificial neural network. I mean, this was not deep learning. This was just... Uh, uh, a, a single hidden layer neural network, and this is driving towards the, the connection between this story and the, the thing I just said about overfitting to get us to that tensor flow discussion in a few minutes here. And so what did we do? Well, we were handed this as our data set. 
Uh, it doesn't look very complicated. This, this, this was our training set. Okay, so basically they handed us a, an ASCII file every single day. There was one of these files every single day. Uh, so we literally had you know, 365 of these for every year that they'd been running this project. And they had the latitude and longitude of where in some satellite image they saw a bright spot that may, that may be fire. And then they have the time of day and which satellite, which instrument on that satellite it was used to make the identification. I'm not gonna give you the whole time of story here, but anyway, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, this, this was our training <coughs> set uh, out, out of like literally just hundreds of gigabytes of satellite imagery. This is what they handed us, okay? So, so we had to go back and work with the data. So, so, so one thing I learned in this project is, is, is this old adage which you read in textbooks and you hear all the time about data prep takes 40 to 60% of a project time. I discovered that was a complete lie. It took like 98% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so literally it was a two year project in the first, in the first uh, one year and 50 weeks <laughs> we were prepping the data and in the last two weeks of the two year project we actually got into our cover. Okay, but so, so what we had to do is we had to take that file and go back to the satellite imagery uh, to identify the fire location. So here's, a, here's an image actually in, in, uh, in pseudo color of uh, the of Florida. <coughs> you sort of barely see the, 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 the Florida <coughs> Peninsula there. Uh, so there's a, on a sort of at, at the halfway point down the, down the left side of the, of the peninsula there, that's the Tampa Bay. And then you go up toward the, the Panhandle, Tallahassee and all that kind of good stuff. And the, so there's a little uh, box, a little red box which you might see, which is encircling uh, a, a spot, so this is a negative image, so this is a hot spot. So this hot spot is that was a fire that identified by those analysts. So our job is to say, okay, here's, here's the image, here's what we see, and we had three different bands, visual band, near-infrared, and mid-infrared bands. So we had three different visual bands, three different satellite images for each spot. And we were supposed to say, okay, what is it about this pattern that corresponds to a fire? Now just to let you know, it's not a trivial of finding a hot spot, because a, a, a bright spot in a visual image could be just a reflection of sunlight <coughs> off of a body of water. So a bright spot does not necessarily mean that it's a fire, right? So the way you determine that is you look at the infrared band and it's not bright. It's bright as optical, but it's not bright in infrared, so it's probably just sunlight reflecting off of someone's swimming pool. Okay, so that's not a fire. Okay, so things that are high intensity in the infrared and in the visual are probably fires. But another thing about it is it's not a point, it's not a single pixel, it has, it, it has an extension. Okay, so that it, it, there's diff some fires which are hot in the middle and cooler out in the outside because it hasn't burned out yet. And then there are some which are exactly the opposite. If, if, if you're like a halo fire, they've already consumed all the fuel at the middle, so it's basically cool in the middle, but it's bright annulus because it's burning out. Okay, so there's all kinds of interesting topology <coughs> pixels there, and, uh, and in, in the three different bands that we have in order to determine what pattern in these images corresponds to what analysts are actually seeing. So again, when you're training set, it's just basically a list of latitude, longitudes, and times of day. Uh, <laughs> there's not a whole lot to go on. And so, the, so we built this model, and I, I, I always enjoy showing this to my students, uh, because it has 147 variables. So most of my students never saw an equation that had 147 input variables and one output variable, which, is, was, it, which was either a one or a zero. Okay, so that's a pretty astonishing function for most kids in school, right? F of x equals y, well, it's f of x sub one all the way up to x sub 147, and, it, and the output of that function is either a one or a zero. So that's what so what are the one or zero? Is a fire or not a fire? And what are those 147 <coughs> variables? Well, it's three times 49. What is three? Three is a three different visual band uh, band, the visual, infrared, near infrared, near and mid infrared. So we have three bands, and so it's 49 times three. What's the 49? It's seven times. We did a seven by seven pixel cutout of where the fires were. Okay, so that seven by seven pixel cutout turned into a linear array of 49 pixel values times three for the three bands is 147 feature vector, uh, 47 variable uh, feature vector, that was our input to the neural network. And so the idea was there's some kind of pattern in those pixels, whether bright spots cool on the outside or an annulus cool on the inside, or something other than just a bright pixel, and something also that had the infrared flux as well as the visual flux. All these things fed into this model to produce a model that at the end of the day, we achieved the 95 plus or minus a couple percent accuracy that we were looking for. Okay, so th that's, that's what we did, but what did we really do? What we really did is we tried all kinds of different things over that period of the two years, all kinds of different <coughs> models. We tried seven by seven cutouts, five by five cutouts, nine by nine cutouts. We tried all kinds of different combinations of the, of the, of the different images uh, and cutouts and so on and so forth. And all these different things corresponded to a different training <coughs> set of, 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 of data that we trained the neural network. And so as we, as we uh, improved the model, 
we got better and better. The training set error got better and better. That we were, we were better and better and better at representing what was a fire, not a fire in our training set. But the funny thing that happens is that you, you don't do that. That's not how you validate. Okay? The way you validate is you have an unseen training set. You have an unseen set, I should say, that's held out. That's not part of the training. And you want to see how well you do against that un, unseen set, the held out set. So that validation set error, for a while, it's decreasing. Okay, we're doing a good job, we're getting better and better at understanding what a fire looks like, but after a while, we're overfitting. After a while, we're doing that horrible thing called overfitting. So our training set error keeps going down and down and down because we're getting closer and closer to mimicking all those pixels exactly, but all those pixels are not exactly how every single fire looks. Every single fire looks different. All right, so if you start fitting all the little nuances of every single fire, you're overfitting. Okay, so all of a sudden, after a while, if you're, if you're really doing that, you discover that so when you do the holdout set, the validation set, error estimation, all of a sudden it goes to hell. All of a sudden you're, like, you're doing a really bad job on that validation set. And so, so by, by capturing both of these uh, error messages, you, you, you learn quickly that where you need to stop. You need to stop when you find the minimum of that curve. Okay, so now we're getting close to what the TensorFlow is about. TensorFlow is about finding a minimum or an extreme value. In this case, it's, 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 we're talking about error, a minimum trying to find the local minimum in a complex space where we have hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of input variables. So if you're, for example, identifying things that are happening in video surveillance cameras, okay, so each scene, you know, might be a thousand by thousand pixels, and there's 30 scenes per second, and it might be a three minute video, okay? So you're literally got millions, if not hundreds of millions of input pixels, and in that, in that input set, you're trying to determine is this, uh, is this a, a bad actor or not? For example, if you're doing surveillance at an airport, is this person a, a person that we should pay attention to or not? Or if you're looking at some uh, tumors and uh, let's say a, a, an MRI scan of a patient, okay, is that, if you're looking at lots of pixels, which one is, is the deadly tumor or the cancerous tumor, which one isn't? Okay, so getting the true positives and true negatives correct is a for some people, and uh, this is why this is important. So those, those spaces in which we're trying to find the minimum of the function, it's not simple as this linear curve I just showed here. It's a very complex space, but it's all about the same thing. It's all about finding that point that keeps us from overfitting and keeps us from underfitting. Okay, so you can, you can continue improving your model on the training set, but you've got to make sure you find that sweet spot in the validation set. So that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to find that best spot. And so in mathematics, we call this hill climbing or a gradient descent, if you want to think of it, whether you're going up or going down. Okay, so the idea is if you have a function and you see that it's decreasing, you can estimate, well, what's the slope of this curve? How, how, how far down should I go before I find the minimum, okay? So you want, you want what's called the learning rate. It's not to be too large, because you'll completely overshoot, and you don't want it too small, because it'll take you eternity to get down there. And if each of these models that we ran took, you know, hours to run. Uh, if it takes uh, hours to run, you don't want to have a learning rate that's so tiny, you're, you're just gradually taking, you know, baby steps down this big hill. You want to make it more efficient. So, you, so the learning rate is the trick that TensorFlow uses to find the, the right model adjustment to the input parameters based upon the, the slope of some complex curve. All right, so this complex curve won't look like that, but the learning rate is essentially finding that, that sweet spot in delta y that you don't overshoot the minimum of your, of your error uh, curve, and, and you don't, nor do you spend internally trying to get there. So when you have this very complex space, there's no like real simple mathematical formula for this, right? So again, if you're looking for identifying uh, uh, anomalous behaviors in video surveillance or anomalous things in, in MRI video scans, you know, it's, it's not a simple little linear function. It's a very complex function. Okay, so trying to find that sweet spot has to do with calculating, this is where TensorFlow comes in, you're now calculating how does the model accuracy improve as I adjust every single one of the 150 million different input parameters on my model, okay? And so you find out that the, what's in some math called the gradient, or the derivative, or the slope, if you want to call it that, the rate of change of the error function as I adjust this parameter, as I adjust that parameter, that, 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 and, 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 and not only that, but how do, they, how do they change when I change them in concert together? And you might end up at a saddle point, as shown in this little animated figure here. A saddle point is something that's a minimum in one dimension, but a maximum in another dimension. That's kind of a scary place to be when you're doing any kind of gradient descent or hill climbing algorithm. So you want to find all these different combinations of variables that lead you to the ultimate true minimum of your error function, which is the sweet spot, which is the final solution to the model you're trying to, uh, to build. Okay, so in our case, in the wildfire case, uh, we had a one-dimensional error curve. I showed you that one-dimensional curve of error versus something. Okay, 
tonight. We had the, the training error, set error, and the validation set error, you remember that? So what was that x-axis? I never actually said what the x-axis was. The y-axis was model error. The x-axis was, was model number number one, number two, three. <laughs> uh, not a very useful independent variable. Okay, so we had, we had tried all kinds of different models and we just numbered them, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, like Okay, so as a function of model number, I'm gonna show you how our error group, and so we found the sweet spot. That's not, okay, so model number is not a fundamental constant of nature, a fundamental parameter <laughs> in the world, it's something we just made up. Okay, so, but, so in, in a real data set like uh, in images, okay, so there's all these parameters, uh, which are the, the input variables of the model, which might be colors, shapes, sizes, orientations, uh, patterns you see in, in your data, and as, it, as you sort of characterize or auto-encode those parameters, how do you adjust the parameters of that model? If you want to call it, if you want to call it this way, some kind of nonlinear combination of those inputs leads to the best model. The f of many x's equals a one or a zero. What is the best combination of all those x's that give you the right height, the highest accuracy, one or zero prediction? So that's what TensorFlow is trying to achieve. Now I call this a calculus of uh, variation. So, so anyone physics background here? Study uh, mechanics, so to study classical mechanics, there's a thing called principle of least actions or principle of least action, not, not to get into the, the concept there, but basically it's, it, it's, the, it's the curve that, that under constant energy constraint uh, that a particle will naturally follow, geodesic we call it, that it so the natural trajectory of a particle will minimize the action, which is the difference between the potential and kinetic energy. So you can't take two wild swings in one or the other, you minimize that function and you find the actual true trajectory of a particle. So what's happening here in data science? So it, it, it's, it's minimizing a function under a constraint. What is a constraint? The constraints are the output class labels, if you will, of the training set. We cannot change that. The class labels of the training set are fixed. All right, so under the constraints, <coughs> like in classical mechanics, energy is conserved. Okay, we, okay, we, can, we can't find a, a path, a trajectory that changes energy, because energy is conserved. So under the constraint that something is fixed, in this case the class labels, how can you adjust the parameters to minimize the error function in this very complex space, and that's what TensorFlow is trying to achieve. All right, so that's TensorFlow, right? Or I should say, that's machine learning through the lens of TensorFlow. So this is sort of where my talk ended on the TensorFlow uh, conference, uh, meetup that I did back. But before I finished my slides that night, I said, well, I got some notes to myself. Okay, so I want to give you the notes to myself, which, uh, which will summarize this in three short slides, hopefully then I'll give you know, the floor to Mark. Okay, so the so in three short slides, hopefully, uh, most of this out. What, what, is, what does this mean? What, how, what is TensorFlow? Again, I remember I gave this talk in the context that I didn't know anything about TensorFlow, so I was gonna learn by giving. All right, so, so gradient descent is sort of the, 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 the fundamental mathematical concept. You're gonna, you wanna find what is the sort of change of the error as a function of all these different input parameters and follow that hill, follow downhill till you find that minimum spot, that minimum error location. So that's what we're trying to achieve, and that's what exactly what we did with our uh, our uh, <coughs> weather service wildfire example, even though it didn't look anything like a deep learning algorithm. It was just a one single layer neural network. But we essentially followed that process. And so we wanted to find that place where the, where the slope of the error function, as a function of your model inputs, reaches uh, the slope of zero, which is, again, an extremum point in the model system. <coughs> so that helps us to avoid those sins of data science overfitting and underfitting. Okay, so we want to set the learning rate. Uh, so TensorFlow has it automatically built in. It says how 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 much how big should we make the changes in our parameters? If I know if I know the error will change by y percent if I if I change x by uh, the inputs by x percent, then I can adjust that x so that I don't overshoot or I don't spend forever coming down the hill. Okay, so we want to set that learning rate. And so the idea is that this 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 complex space where we're taking these slopes. Okay, so and, and, and Calculus, we call that a derivative or a gradient. Okay, in, a multi in a high dimensional space, it's not just uh, the, the slope that function of y or, or x, it's, it's a function of x and y and z and all these things. <coughs> so, this actually, in physics term and math terminology, is called a tensor. That's why it's called tensor. So, that complex set of gradients and that very complex topology is a, is a mathematical data structure called a tensor. Okay, so, a data structure is two dimensions, it's like a matrix, okay, but it can be an n dimension. So what happens is that we're, we're following this principle of least action, okay, this, 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 this calculus of variations. Okay, so this calculus of variations says we want to minimize some function under some constraint. Now we see this a lot in, in the actual real world. Okay, 
Okay, so in mathematics, it's a very it's a very common thing. For example, I have three examples there. Uh, the, the shape, the geometric <coughs> shape that contains the most area for a fixed perimeter is a circle. Okay, so if you actually did a calculation and said, okay, the if I, I want to fix the perimeter, I, I have no liberty to change the perimeter of my shape. What is the, the shape that contains the most area for a fixed perimeter? That's a circle. Okay, what's the volume that contains okay the smallest surface area, or what's the, what's the solid that contains uh, the smallest surface area for a fixed volume, that's a sphere. Okay, so there's there's things like this which are propagated in mathematics. Uh, the second thing in this example is the physics example, which is the one I just <coughs> mentioned, that we can find the, the trajectory of a, of a point in a very complex space. And so people who do general relativity and understand, for example, the, the, the pulsating uh, the black hole mergers that found gravitational waves earlier this year, and hopefully we'll see those scientists getting the Nobel Prize soon. Uh, so that would be, uh, so, th so these principles of least action appear in physics. So in very complex spaces, we can find a trajectory of a, of, a, of a particle in a complex gravitational field, for example. We don't need to solve hard problems. We can solve the computational uh, least, uh, least action principle. So, the, so these are common in textbooks. Now, the one that's not common is the third one there. And so when I was thinking about this, I thought about this example. Uh, driving around the Beltway in Washington, you probably know what I'm talking about. <coughs> There's these things called hot lanes. Okay, so Northern Virginia, there are these hot lanes, right? And it's variable toll. People know this, right? So the variable toll, the way it works is that there's a lot of traffic on the main lanes, and, and it's really slow, the prices get jacked up on the toll. All right? And there's not a lot of traffic on the regular lanes, and there's a, it's, a, it's a small toll on the, on the toll. Okay, so it's variable pricing, and it, it's, it's a complex function of a lot of inputs. The number <coughs> of cars, the speed of the traffic, time of day, road condition, da 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 da, -da a lot of Okay, it's a complex function. It's a very complex function. And what the company wants to do is maximize their revenue as a function of all these different parameters. So they, they set the toll based upon how many cars, how fast they're moving, et cetera, all these different inputs. So I asked my students this question to think about this as a thought experiment, not actually solve this problem, but as a thought experiment. Okay, think about revenue. So, so revenue is a positive definite number. It's not profit. Right? Revenue is just how much gross receipts do you get. Okay, so I asked my students, how much revenue do you think that toll company that's running those hot lanes gets if they set the toll to be zero dollars? Zero, okay, that's an easy one. How much revenue does this company get if they set the toll to be a trillion dollars? Zero, see most of my students don't get it that fast. <laughs> yeah, because no one would ever use the lens, so they would charge a trillion dollars. So somewhere between a zero dollar toll and a trillion dollar toll is a positive <coughs> function that has a maximum. It is a positive function, we're talking revenue, not so somewhere it's not zero, and somewhere it's positive. So how do you find that positive, you know, the, the extreme most positive value of that revenue function? Well, I don't think there's any simple equation anywhere. But it's really a calculus of variation problem. It's under, constant, uh, under a fixed constraint, which is you've got to move the same number of cars from A to B. That doesn't change. So given that you have to move cars from A to B, what is the, what is the toll that you can set on that road to maximize the revenue of the company? Now, I don't think they're doing deep learning there. Uh, maybe we should have a talk with them and see if we can help them out there. Because they, they got some kind of algorithm which is proprietary and I have no idea what it is, but I bet just not deep learning. But, anyway. but, but, it, it, but again, it, it's, it's a calculus of variations problem, which is again, you have a, a very complex problem with a, a complex set of variables in a complex space, and there's no way you can write an equation down. But what you're looking for is that maximum value, that, that extreme value of a very complex function under a constraint. In that case, again, the, the number of cars you're moving is a big So, last slide, last slide. So I notice to myself, I was just summing this all up. So deep learning, deep learning, uh, which tends to flow with an algorithm that does deep learning. You know, and deep learning basically means you have many, many, many hidden layers, unlike my uh, wildfire example, which only had one hidden layer. So we, we sent in our images, and we looked at the sort of the connections and patterns and relationships between those things, which lead to one output, a one or a zero fire. Out. So deep learning builds upon all these deep, uh, these, con these concepts of machine learning that we've grown to know and love, but, uh, for, but for much more complex inputs, uh, arrays, images, text, video. So, so complex inputs uh, have very complex interrelationships between all those parameters, those parameters and those inputs. Again, if we're talking about pixels and images, uh, pixels and video sequences, they could be hundreds of millions of inputs. And so deep learning then minimizes this error function. Well, by functional means it's a function of functions. Okay, So this error function, by, uh, we're minimizing error or maximizing accuracy, if you will, and this complex topology under a constraint, in this, in this case, the constraint is that the training labels can't change. 
right? So if we, we can find a model that really predicts some things really nicely, but if it, if it predicts the wrong answer, what good is that, okay? So it does a really good job of predicting ones and zeros, just the wrong ones. Okay, it's sort of like the Hubble mirror, right? I don't know if you lived through that. I lived through that. I worked, I worked at the Hubble telescope when they launched in the mirror with the disaster. Some people might remember this, right? So that, that was the world's most perfect mirror. It was perfectly polished to the wrong shape. Okay. Uh, so, so the test device that, 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 that tested the curvature of that mirror was incorrect. But the test was perfect. It perfectly fit the incorrect <laughs> shape. Okay. So we had a, a most perfect, imperfect mirror. Anyway, so, so the idea is you cannot change things that need that are fixed. So you can't change the, the training method. So that's, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the capitalist variation part. Finding that minimum of that error function under the constraint that you can't change the training level into the very complex parameters. And the way we do that with tensor flows, again, we use the tensors, which is this hyperdimensional set of slopes. How does the error change if I change x, if I change y, if I, just, if I change x and y in combination, and all possible combinations. Uh, and again, this is not trivial. That's why Google uses a, you know, a million cluster computer to compute this. <laughs> okay, so it's not something you're going to do on the back of an envelope. Okay, so, so we want to do all of that while avoiding the sins of data science, which are overfitting and under.
Um, tonight, I am going to talk about sparkly R. Get out of here. And give you an overview of this really, really cool tool. So the typical disclaimer, the opinions expressed tonight are mine and mine alone. Um, that's in case anything that I should say comes up, but no. Um, <laughs> just covering everybody's behind. <laughs> okay, show of hands. Who has experience with Hadoop in this room? Okay, all right. Uh, not, not many, that's fine. Who has experience with Spark? Who has experience with both R, uh, Hadoop and Spark? Okay, so um, who has experience with Scala? <laughs> Not many of you. <laughs> who loves R? Woo! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, so, so again, why are we here? This, is, that, this, is that confirmation bias? That is confirmation <laughs> <laughs> So anyone that knows me knows that I'm an R lover and an advocate. Uh, I'm a big proponent of R. I, I came into R sort of by accident. And I really, really have enjoyed the you know using the tool. But I think more than the tool has been the community, uh, the folks I've met over the years, and being able to. I mean, what I found about the data science community worldwide, at least through the through the entryway from the R community, was how people are willing to just share knowledge and learn from one another. And you know, th I think this is a huge change in how business and investigation and, and research is done today, like people are definitely more willing to share. And of course, it, you know, the access of open tools and open research and the of research, et cetera. But anyway, I'm a huge R proponent and that's not, a, that's not um, any secret. So so I'm gonna talk about tonight a little bit, uh, again, for those of you that, kn that, that know about, probably have heard about Spark, don't know too much about it, I'm gonna touch a little bit about that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Sparkly R and compare it to another package that already exists called Spark R. Again, these are very high level comparisons uh, because Sparkly R has only been out uh, very shortly actually. And um, based on my limited experience. The, the, then I'm gonna show you how to kind of how to install it and configure it so everything works nicely together. Um, specifically on AWS Elastic MapReduce. Um, Elastic MapReduce. And then, uh, time permitting, we'll try to do a quick demo. Uh, I do have a cluster up and running. Um, I have like two or three lines of code that I wanted to run, so hopefully we'll have some time. Again, this is this is this will give us cover the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so, so, and we'll take questions at the end. Okay, so um, so I'm sure you, all of you have heard about Spark, right? So what is Spark? Spark is uh, it depends depending on where you where you. Um, <coughs> Google, <laughs> by the way, I don't know how I would do my job today if it weren't for the internet, I, I swear. <laughs> and I tell my students this, I said, if we were learning this 20 years ago, I don't know how we would do, because without the internet, without the access of social media, I, I swear, without Stack Overflow, without Google, I, I don't know how I would do my job, because trust me, I, I can't remember everything. I find myself using, I, every so often I look at my Google history, I spend a lot of time on Google. <laughs> so anyway, um, it, essentially it's a, it's a it's a cluster computing framework. Um, it was developed by the AMP, uh, AMP Lab team out of Berkeley back in like 2009 or so. Um, and it was written as essentially a, a different paradigm to big data problems uh, as, a, as sort of a all encompassing tool. It was a cluster <coughs> manager, it was a data processing engine, it was all of the above. And what you can really con compare and contrast it to is, is the Hadoop MapReduce framework. And they're really two different beasts. Um, one, and, and they're both, both tools are great for their for very specific tasks. The main difference between like Hadoop MapReduce, the traditional MapReduce, is that in traditional MapReduce, everything is disk-based. It's, it's input out, those, you're reading from a distributed file system, you're writing to a distributed file system, it's done in batches, um, and it's not really a memory-bound problem. Uh, Spark, on the other hand, is more of a, it uses its memory. It, it, it has its own cluster computing <coughs> framework manager, um, but it also is designed to work with, with the cluster of memory, and it's definitely much faster. When I saw, I, I saw the first Spark talk at Strata, I think about two years ago, and the, uh, the Databricks folks were 
and showing off the, the benchmark. And it was really impressive. Uh, I mean, Spark was about 100 to 1,000 times faster than MapReduce for, for very simple tasks. So I was really intrigued by Spark back then. I didn't have a chance to use it until uh, about a year ago on, on a project I worked on. And then um, I'm not using it for a project, but I'm, I'm really just kind of playing with it and trying to get to know it better and also teaching it. Um, teaching big data is really challenging, um, especially for folks that want to come and learn about, they, folks want to come and learn how to run without necessarily learning how to walk. There's a lot of technical, there are really real technical uh, concepts that people need to understand before diving into big data. And there's a really huge, and I, what I find is that there's a really big gap in sort of where, you know, what people want to learn and where they are. And I, I think I've done a reasonable job in, in trying to fill that gap with, with, with the folks that take my classes. But, um, but again, that always keeps me thinking like how to try to do things better, how to make tools more accessible, how to, how to talk about these ideas in, in a way that makes sense. And again, being an R user, so I'll get to that in a second, sorry. So again, uh, back to Spark. So Spark is, is, is really fast, it does stuff in memory, uh, it is written in Scala. Uh, Scala, I don't know Scala. Scala is a functional programming language. Um, I think it's a great language. I, I know very little of it because I had to use it when I first started using Spark. But the nice thing of Spark was when it first came out, it really enabled you to use the tool either by knowing uh, Scala, knowing Java, knowing Python, and out of the gate there was no R, but the R support was there from pretty early. Very crude, but it was there from pretty early. So Spark runs on a cluster. Um, it can run on its own, it can run on a Hadoop cluster, it definitely talks to HDFS, which is a Hadoop distributed file system. It can run standalone. So that was like one of the great things about Spark is you didn't have to have a you didn't have to have another cluster to run Spark. Spark could run on whatever you had. Again, uh, if you had Hadoop 1.0, you need a separate cluster with Hadoop 2.0 and Yarn, that went away because Yarn really became the, the manager for all of these big data systems. Um, so, a little bit about lazy evaluation. Uh, the way Spark works is as you're typing your scripts or as it's calculating what it's going to do next, it doesn't really take any action until you do one of two things. Either collect the data from the cluster to back to where you are and into your master node or your driver, or you do some kind of um, aggregation or in MapReduce analogy would be a reduce, uh, a reduce type of that. So, I think Spark is awesome, but it's really thin especially in its early days. And this is, this you see this with every big data tool out there. It's like, when it first comes up, it's like, yes, it's the best thing since sliced bread. You look at the documentation, it's like, well, they haven't talked about what I want to do. And then your use case hasn't been covered, and then you try to do something, and it's like, you can't figure it out, and you hit your head against the wall many times until you something, and you have the aha moment. So that has been my journey into the big data world. I, I, really, that, that, has, that was how I got into this. Uh, by doing, and doing, and doing, and learning, and talking, and Watch rinse repeat. Why do I like Spark VR? When I saw it, I, I said, "This is awesome." Um, so it's the last bullet, but it real to me what Spark VR, what it means for me and what it means for our users is that it lowers the barrier to entry to using Spark significantly. Um, <coughs> that's I think that should have been bullet number one. Bullet number two, which is now number one, is it's by the R Studio team. Enough said. Uh, I cannot praise the RStudio team enough. Uh, I've been an RStudio user since the very beginning. Of course, we all know uh, who's a follower of uh, the Church of Hadley Wickham. Okay, so <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Hadley's part of RStudio. Actually, Max Kuhn just Good announced. Uh, Max Kuhn, who wrote the carrot package, just joined RStudio. So as you can see, they've been assembling a killer team of people that have made R such a great tool to use. Made the tools to make art so much e so easy to use, and also really contributes back to the community. So um, essentially, what Sparkly Art is, it allows you to run to do <coughs> to use a cluster as a backend for your data by typing in dplyr like commands. Uh, it really is as simple as that. Um, it's still early. I think it works reasonably well. I haven't really tested it enough, um, but the few things I've done and the few examples I've seen, it's really cool because I'm sure if 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 you're an R user, you probably have started to use dplyr at some point in time. If you haven't, start. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, like any 
a lot of the tools that Hadley and company have provided have just really made R so much more easier, easy to use. And and I know they're not part of the core R. I don't think they'll ever be. But without those tools, I don't think R had would have had such an acceptance as it has today. So basically, what it does is you write. So who knows Dplyr? Okay. So for those, raise your hand if you don't know what Dplyr is. Okay. A little context here. So Dplyr is a package that allows you to to basically write uh, a pipeline of commands. And I'll show you some. I'll show you some code in the next slide or following slide. And essentially, it gives you a very basic set of of verbs that act on your data. So filter. Um, Filter, mutate, group by, uh, summarize. So all, of, all these are these are sort of the. If you come from an SQL background, you know these you know these commands in, in different syntax, right? Well, group by kind of self-explanatory. A filter is 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 a where clause, right? In, in your SQL query, um, mutate is you're just creating a new variable in your in your table. You're generating a new variable in your table. Um, summarize is so grouping by group by takes take something and splits it in by key and then summarize it, collapses it to a single row, whether it's a mean, it's a sum, any operation that collapses a group of records into a single row. These are very natural data processing commands and what dplyr allows you to do is allows you to use these commands in, in sort of a pipe, in a pipe fashion. Um, <laughs> so I'll use this as an example, but the easy button. So no, I, I I think I call I call Spark. I, I think our Spark layer is the easy button for for R and Spark for Spark because the top code is Scala. It does. Nothing against Scala, <laughs> but it's ugly. Um, you love all your children. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, this is gonna go down very quickly. <laughs> Standing between you and beer, so mm. so I, I gotta move. Good but job. essentially, you know, the top the top set of code um, basically takes and reads a file from HDFS. It splits it by it takes like a CSV or a tab limited file and splits it by by tab, and then it creates new variables, and then it does a group by and etc. So this is what it looks like in Scala. The bottom is what it looks like in Spark R using Dplyr. Now Dplyr actually this is Sparkly R. This is Sparkly R. So uh, I'll talk about the <coughs> term sorry. So you see here there's this um, percent greater than percent. That's the piping operator. And what it allows you to do, so this here is essentially dplyr works the same, doesn't matter what your backend is, whether it's a data frame, it's data on a database, or in this case it's data in the Spark cluster. So you kind of start with, with a data set, you pipe it into into the next operation. Here you say mutate, so I'm creating a new field, which is summing at one field one percent, field two. Then you're, I'm doing another operation, which is grouping by. And what it is, is it's a pipeline. A lot of data analysis is very, um, a lot of it is very linear, right? So in the old days, before something like this, you would have to create queries, then create maybe a, either reassign queries or create a new variable with your next step, and then create a new variable with the next step. What this does is this passes the result of one step next to the next, to, you know, as the input into the next. It's kind of the same idea as a, a pipe in, in Unix and Linux takes the output and it passes it in as an input to something else. So there's a series of verbs that allows you to do pretty, I, I would say 70 to 80 percent of your data processing or data analysis, and then you have to do more advanced things. But 70 or 80 percent, and again, I'm just making up a number, but uh, a lot of this you can do with these five verbs, filter, move, mutate, group, by, summarize, etc. So as you can see, if, I mean, if you're an R user, you see this and you run away. You'll see this, and it's a whole different story. So um, there is another package out there. So so just kind of out of so Sparkly has a bunch of uh, has about five groups of functions um, that are just built in here. The documentation is pretty pretty good actually. The R the R Studio team does a phenomenal job uh, with their tools and their documentation. So I'm not going to spend too much time, but I have I have a link, and I will these slides will be available. But there are a bunch of different groups of functions. So Spark underscore something it, it, it manages the connection. Um, Spark read and Spark write. So it gives you native 
native support from uh, CS, like any sort of delimited file, JSON, and um, Parquet, which is a uh, a columnar open source columnar database that runs on top of uh, is it's an app, another app, Apache project. Um, SDF it does operations with Spark data frames. So there's this whole idea. So Spark is very complicated. The nomenclature can be a little bit tricky. Even myself, I find it sometimes confusing because you have the Spark RDD, which is your basic unit of data, which is the resilient distributed data set, which is an abstraction which takes a data set and distributes it distributes it across, across your cluster. But then they have, they created this thing called Spark Data Frames, which is essentially akin to an R data frame, for lack of a better term. Um, then there's Spark SQL, which you can do, you know, you don't need Scala, you don't need R, you can write SQL on top of Spark. So it, the ecosystem is somewhat confusing, um, but this set of SDL <coughs> works on, on these data frame uh, things. Spark DR also gives you an API to do to run machine learning on Spark out of the box. It already has a bunch of algorithms that come with Spark with uh, Spark ML, which is a machine learning library that make up part of Spark. And then uh, FP is feature transform uh, that does allows you to do a whole bunch of um, feature transformation. So if you go to their website, really the website is just really good and it, it has a lot of great examples. Before Sparkly R, there was this um, this other package called Spark R. Spark R started as a side project, which then got merged into the uh, Spark mainline as of version 1.6, I think, or earlier this year or late last year. And it's essentially, it was an R interface, more more general R interface to Spark. Still allows you to connect to a cluster uh, and do kind of some things using R commands that kind of got translated to, to either Scala or Java. Um, but I always found it a little bit confusing to use, and of course, when Sparkly R came out, it's like, okay, I love Defire. It's really simple. You know, it, it it just makes it so much. Again, it lowers significant. I think it significantly lowers the barriers to entry for any R user that wishes to do cluster computing using Spark. This doesn't solve a whole other set of problems, which is like starting a cluster, managing a cluster, uh, doing all of the DevOps and sysadmin that that comes with all this. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a second. So I think there there is a step, again, like I said, what would I do without Stack Overflow? So Spark R versus Sparkly R, that's what I Google, because I don't know the difference. Um, but in, in essence, what it is, is it, right now, Sparkly R just gives you these five verbs that can get converted to SQL type code that get run on the Spark backend. Um, it doesn't give you the ability to run user-defined functions. Not yet. It, it'll probably come, but I don't know. Spark R is just a more general um, front end to Spark using R. And, and that's about as much as I really can compare the contrast to. There really isn't much documentation <coughs> that compares and contrasts. I haven't used them enough to be able to, to, to know what the real differences are. So, moving on to sort of the next thing. So, great, I have this tool. There's all these examples out there. Yeah, I want to do big data analysis. Well, what do I do? I start a cluster. Well, guess what? You can start a cluster very easily on Amazon uh, AWS Elastic MapReduce. Who has experience with uh, AWS EMR, Elastic MapReduce? Oh, okay, I thought more of you. So Amazon, you know Amazon has a big cloud services offering, right? One of their products, not only, so EC2 is their virtual service. EMR is called Elastic MapReduce, is essentially a managed Hadoop service where you say, I want to start a cluster of X number of nodes, and what it does is it starts a cluster for you, it, ins it installs all the Hadoop software, it does all the cluster configuration, and all you really need to do is use it. <coughs> well, not quite. So, do you want to, it, so it has R, but it doesn't have R Studio, and it doesn't have all the other packages that you might need. So, what do you have to do? Well, in the old days, you would have to start the cluster, and connect to the cluster and install all these different tools, et cetera. So the folks at, um, the engineers at AWS, so when you start a cluster or you may start a virtual machine on, on, on Amazon, you can use what's called a bootstrap script, which is essentially a shell script, a bash script that can do all sorts of things that can install software, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, there's, there, there's, there's a link to this blog post which was written by a friend of mine, Tom Gunn, who's an engineer at AWS. And, and, and he and I have been talking about the bootstrap script for a long time. The, what I like about this one specifically is that it installs RStudio. 
and it makes our studio accessible to you. And basically, our studio gets installed in the master node of your cluster. So you basically connect to that node, to that master node, and that is your entry point into your cluster. And that, from that master node, you can talk, you can run, you can use our studio, you can use R, through the web because it's our studio server. And um, then you can issue the Spark commands. So it does all sorts of other things. It sets your environment, your goals, et cetera. So a lot of this stuff doesn't work out of the box. And there's great examples out there, especially from Sparkly R. So the R Studio team has a good example about um, using Sparkly R, which I'll show in a second. What, what, what really frustrates me when I see a lot of these examples is that it, they make it seem so simple, and it really isn't. If you don't have the knowledge about <laughs> what really entails to run a cluster, this can be daunting. So um, I, I've been using this bootstrap script a lot. Um, I've been using it in class with my students so that they can actually start a cluster and they can use R on the cluster, they can use R Studio because that's what, that's what they want to use. They, they know R, they're familiar with R, so I want to give them the best possible experience um, and the tool that they know how to use to make them comfortable. So this bootstrap action, it, what it does, again, it makes, it installs our studio, it makes it accessible via port 877, which is your standard, your default port. Um, it also, every, <coughs> it also creates a user for you. You know, on Amazon's infrastructure, the default username is Hadoop. So you log into your cluster using your Hadoop username, and every service is tied to that user. So you run every service using the Hadoop username. You also run, you can log into our studio using the Hadoop username. So everything is integrated. But it does all this back-end processing for you, which would be really daunting. It also installs <coughs> Sparkly R. Sparkly R has to be, in, you can install it without the bootstrap script, but you also have to set the environment variables yourself. And it's, it's really, it, 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 can, it can be a pain if you, if you don't know what environment variables you need to use. Uh, the only caveats about this bootstrap action is that it has uh, an R Studio version that's 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 dated. It's about a year old. I, I recently this week was trying to update it and I couldn't get it to work. I don't know why. And the other sort of downside is that this bootstrap script is very specific just to Amazon's platform, right? Because it's a bootstrap script that runs only when you start an Amazon cluster. Um, I'll get to that in a second. So, right, I got to speed up. So. Using Sparkly R, it's, it's really simple. I mean, so there's there's a lot more to this, but to invoke it, what happens is you do at the top, is the, the top the top one is, is again, this assumes your environment variables are set, so you call, you, you load your library Sparkly R, you load dplyr, and then you create a Spark connection using this SC to Spark context. And in the, the top case, it's actually using the yarn client, so it's actually using the cluster. Um, in the bottom one, this is actually running this is on my Mac. So here you see I actually had to set my environment variable. The first one is to tell it where Spark is first. And then it, you see the difference in master here is yarn client because I'm using a, a yarn run cluster. And here I'm just using Spark locally. So that's, again, those are the first three lines of code that will allow R to talk to your Spark cluster. So <laughs> now I'm gonna sort of show a little bit about it. I try to do a little mini demo. And um, I just want to, so I'm going to use, so who has heard about the New York City taxi data set? Okay. I call that the new big data iris data set. So you know how iris is used for every single example. And then from iris it went to the flights data set. Now it's the New York City taxi data set. So again, so it's great. There's a really amazing blog post out there. And, and there, there's, there's a link here to the, Git, to the GitHub repo. But the way Todd worked on this, he actually loaded it into a, a database on his, on his Mac. He loaded about 250 gigabytes of data on a Postgres database, or post, and then another PostGIS database on his Mac, and it let it run for like three days. I'm like, come on, there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> so um, the R Studio team actually wrote, their example is based on this data set. The problem is that the data is not readily available. I mean, the data is publicly accessible, but it's on a cluster. So if you want to do, like if you want to run these examples, you have to take this data and you have to put it on a cluster. So I did that. Um, I took the files, I ran through the script, I pulled all those files from wherever they were and I pushed them to, um, I pushed them to an S3 repository that I have that actually uh, I'm, I'm trying to collect large data sets that <coughs> designed for teaching. And then what I did is I created, it should be Parquet. So Parquet is this Calmer database. I, 
do they work on these files that are actually converted from CSVs to Parquet? So I did that last night. I actually took the CSVs and converted them to Parquet so that when they get so when I reload them into Spark, it's actually much faster. And I'll show you some benchmarks. Um, what we'll see in this little mini demo is I'm going to read in the Parquet files and I'm going to do again very simple bunching and, and aggregation. But I just want to give you an idea of what this looks like. So. I always tell people to not do live demos, live coding demos, and I'm not following that advice. So here it is. So this is R. Here we have R running on a cluster, R Studio running on a cluster. This is my master node. Um, and basically what I've done here is, I, I'm not going to run through the code again because it takes a little bit of time. But just to give you an idea is here I took, so I, I you know, I loaded my Sparkly R library, I loaded my DeepCloud library, then I made my Spark connection. Um, here, I actually loaded, I first loaded, yes, this, yesterday when I first loaded the, um, the, the CSVs, again, you see I used the Spark read CSV function um, that was coming from my, my S3 repository. It took, this is the green one, the yellow one, just, the yellow one, the, there's, two, there's two cab data sets, there's a yellow cab and the gray cab. Um, the yellow one is about 150-ish gigs, 200 gigs, something along those lines. And um, so it took 1,500 seconds. So it took about, what, what's that, so about 1,800, yeah, about, about 25 minutes to read, just to, you know, just to create that Spark context, that just to like load in, to read in, to, to, to navigate through those files and have access to that data. It's not really being read into memory. At this point, you're just creating a connection, and Spark is, is knows where these files exist, but it has to comb through all these files first. When I converted that to Parquet, um, again using Spark R, rather than using Spark read CSV, I use Spark read Parquet, and again I'm calling it from a different location, and it went from what was it, 1500? It went from 1500 to 500 seconds. So pretty big uh, resource called, or the variable called yellow trip by year. So I'm taking the yellow data, which is about 900 million rows. Can I just show you that? Yeah, I must have lost, because I read this a while back, I must have lost connection, so I apologize. I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, I had it ready to go, so man, don't like to do it. What this is doing is, what it does is, it actually takes 900, almost a billion rows, and it, it basically creates a summary just a total by year. And what I get is just this summary. So when I talk about big data, you know, the big data tools allow you to take data that's really, really, really big, usually make it, you can make it Smaller big, but smaller big such that it's manageable on a single machine. So, um, <coughs> so I have a couple of different resources here that I'm going to share with you. These are just blog posts. I'll give you some more in, um, an introduction to Spark, what it is. I'll talk about how Spark manages memory, all these types of things. These are really interesting. These are things that, if you're going to work with these tools, I really recommend that you have a better understanding of how these tools work under the hood. Um, because otherwise, you're just going to always get errors, you, and the errors are cryptic, and it, it's a frustrating experience. And then, well, I guess, you know, kind of my parting thought is, is Spark is finicky. There, you, even though Sparkly R makes it a lot easier to use, there are still parameters you can put in the cluster. There is no one size fits all uh, answer. You just have to do, uh, you know, your mileage of error, you have to use trial and error. There's a lot of parameters you can put in the cluster. Especially with working with Spark, um, and then the other thing is again coming back to this idea. I've actually been collecting these data sets that are publicly available, but not readily. They, I, they, they exist. They are they're in the cloud somewhere, right? But if you want to use them, they're not in a place where you can use them easily. So I've taken two data sets and made them publicly available. One is the New York City taxi data set. Put it up on S3. Right now, it's, there's a bucket. I have it called their S3 Big Data Teaching. Um, and I have both the CSV files and the Parquet. And also there's a, Cattle had a competition last year about, uh, for Trio, which is an online app company. 
uh, that data set was uh, in the order of probably a couple hundred gigabytes, but then that same company released a newer data set, which is a terabyte. Um, and I actually put up that data set up on, on the S3 bucket. So it's very available if you ever want to use it. And I'm, I, I'm doing this collection of things. And then uh, also I'm working on making kind of the bootstrap script idea more manageable so that you can actually launch a cluster, whether it's on Amazon or it's in Google Cloud or on virtual machines. Uh, using tools uh, like Ansible, which is a DevOps tool, which allows you to script your um, your infrastructure. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. We have about five or three minutes of questions, and then we can mingle for a few minutes, and then uh, we can start heading out to the bar. Uh, yeah, let's do that. So thanks again. Um, first of all, let's just have one more round of applause for one or two. My understanding is that with Spark Arc, you can only use a fraction of the machine learning uh, machine learning tools that are available via the like Smart Machine li Learning Library with Spark R. But with Sparkly R, is that also the case? That you, or do, is there an expanded use of all of the machine learning? I'm not. Sh I'm not entirely. I'm not okay. sure. So if you look at the documentation, they they do point to a couple of. Um, My question to you, sir. Um, Let's grab the mic. Please. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you were explaining TensorFlow, you made mention of uh, like the lightning rate and the Lagrangian uh, calculate uh, variables, right? So is it like the whole thing is like an optimization problem at the back end and the lightning the lightning rate? I guess is somehow related to how the the problem is solved from the discretization perspective of the problem, right? Right, right. There is an objective function you're trying yeah, to the objective function. Function. <coughs> uh, in this case it's an error function you want to minimize. Right. And so I, I didn't I didn't really emphasize that, but the but the learning rate, which is the, the delta y, mm -hmm. okay, how much are you improving the the, the estimate how much are you proving the error? Uh, delta y is just not, not, it's essentially the slope of the curve times delta x, right? So, so, so that so so given the learning rate uh, and the slope, so delta y divided by slope, which is the tensor part, uh, then you can estimate how much do you need to back properly, how, how much do you need to adjust the input parameters to get that improvement in the in the uh, error function. Okay, so so so, so it, that delta x, I mean, it, it's, it's hiding a, a lot of complexity here, obviously. But the point is that whatever th whatever the input variables are to the model, you, that that calculation of, of the tensor gives you like for like a five percent improvement in, in the, the learning function, the, the objective function. You, this is how much you need to change all the different parameters, and then you rerun the, the, the code and you find out how well you're doing in terms of that that, that gradient descent. Okay, so so eventually you're gonna you hopefully hope to identify that point where the, you reach the minimum of the function in, the, in this complex space. Yeah. Um, maybe just one last question tonight since we have to clear the space out. And then, uh, but yeah, this continues to go on. Then the, the question will be interesting. I have a question. <laughs> from, uh, the, the, what is yeah. this? There's a lot of uh, work right now of Right, so, so zero day is, is essentially
essentially an example of finding something that doesn't fit any model you've had before, right? Or, 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 or a behavior pattern you've never seen before. Um, so in a sense, uh, one way of thinking, I mean, there's different ways you can think about that as a, as a, as in a sense as an outlier detection problem. But one way you can do an outlier detection problem basically is you try to classify something as a known behavior and, and, and so for, for a, a new, un previously unseen thing, it doesn't fit any model. That, that is, there's a, there's just you get a really bad error, so to speak. And so, that, so, so something that's really off is an indicator that it's, it's not either an A or a B, where an A might be you know, good behavior and B is some prior So the outlier is basically the thing that, that whose uh, error, when you do the error calculation, it just blows up and it, it just doesn't uh, produce a good out, uh, output to prediction. <coughs> so I actually had a student working on a problem like this with us with some galaxy classifications, which seems like a change of subject here, but really because <coughs> we, uh, we had some classification labels and we had some, some data which were given by people who actually just looked at the images, right? So they said, this looks like this, this looks like that. And then we had data which were extracted from the images into databases, so just parameters from the images, like shape, color, size, orientation. So these are just the parameters. And when he built the model uh, for some well-known classes of galaxies, he got like a 95% accuracy. So if you're a galaxy person, you have spirals and ellipticals, right? So we got 95% accuracy of the spirals, 95% elliptical. But for the odd galaxies, uh, we got he got a 5% uh, accuracy. No matter how much he adjusted his model, he only got 5% accuracy. And, and I said, that's ridiculous. I can just flip a coin. It's either an A or a B. I can do better flipping a coin than your and, and so there's actually some additional hidden information in the images that people saw when they labeled it that wasn't captured in, in our data stream. And so uh, deep learning would essentially do this. It would try to put something into a known class label, and it would just get it would just do a really horrible job because it just because it doesn't look like anything we've seen. And so if you sort of kick out those cases where they just don't uh, they don't correspond to any known pattern, uh, then in a sense it's, it's it's deep learning in the sense that the, the, the auto encoded pattern which are the deep models just don't fit the pattern that you're seeing now. And that's the thing that, uh, that, that may be your day zero uh, attack, possibly. I'm not, I'm not a cybersecurity yeah, expert, but that, that, that to me is how I would attack, uh, basically in an unsupervised way, uh, a, a, a pre detecting a pattern that you've never seen before. Because obviously you don't have any training examples. So, so maybe if you're looking for rarity, something that... Not, just, not, not, not even just rare, but, it, but it's, it's just in a, uh, it's in a, it's in a part feature space where you've never seen before. You have all kinds of different behaviors you know, and, and feature you know, parameter values for things that you know, but you, it's now in a place, a place in feature space you've never seen before. So that anomalous behavior gets called out for whatever reason. I mean, it might, it might not be <laughs> a cyber attack. It might just be but something else. Um, so can I just um, stop now because sure. you have to clear the space? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he's throwing us out, by the way. <laughs> um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you at the next event. Uh, stick around if you want to go to our drinks. And again, thanks. Thanks to uh, Yeah, bioinformatics. Yeah, bioinformatics.